It's Thursday, January 11th, and this is The National. Tonight, with the Winter Olympics just around the corner, Canada reveals the men who will defend hockey gold. But how many will you recognize? Donald Trump's latest crude quote about immigrants, what he really thinks of their home countries. But we begin with a sneezing mess across this country as the flu is gripping Canadians hard. Influenza always stalks us, persistent, pernicious, defying defenses. This season, the flu, at last count, has killed at least 34 Canadians and sent some hospital systems reeling. We're, we're seeing reports from all across the country and even overseas that uh, emergency departments and hospitals are bursting at the seams because of this year's flu outbreak. Canada-wide, there have been more than 11,000 reported cases this season. That's actually in line with expectations, but the impact across the country is uneven. Alberta has been battered twice as hard as it was this time last year. In Abbotsford, B.C., the nurses' union there described eight-hour wait times, patients parked in hallways and shower rooms because of the surge of admissions due to the flu. Winnipeg hospitals cancelled about 80 surgeries this week because of the demand for beds. And has Canada reached the peak flu yet? It's too early to tell. Fact is, this flu season has been unusual playing rope-a-dope with the healthcare system. As Christine Birak explains, two strains are bobbing and weaving their way through the country, arriving early, dodging the vaccine and hitting hard. The endless wait. A glimpse into what's happening inside some emergency rooms across the country. Hospital beds are full. Doctors and nurses are scrambling to keep up. This is all I'm seeing these days is flu, flu, flu. There's so much flu. So we're heading into the lab and um, this is where testing is done. So it's not a pandemic year, but it is unusual. Instead of a single flu virus sickening people, right now there are two. One of them is H3N2. Doctors say it brings extra misery, especially for the elderly. We tend to see more severe seasons. We tend to see more outbreaks, more hospitalizations and more deaths. When a virus like H3N2 is floating around, its goal is to get inside you and start making copies of itself. Whether you become sick depends on how long it takes your immune system to recognize the growing number of invaders. If it's seen that virus before, it quickly sends in antibodies and you don't get sick. The flu shot tries to offer the immune system a preview of what to look for, but viruses mutate to avoid detection and... H3N2 tends to change a bit faster than other viruses. There's so much about influenza that we really don't understand. In fact, this year's flu vaccine should have protected people from H3N2. But the bits of virus that go into the shot are grown in eggs. And at some point in the process, the virus mutated. Still, experts say the flu shot offers some protection. There's emerging data to suggest that this might mitigate the severity of one's infection. So if you're going to get this sick from influenza, if you had the vaccine, maybe you'll only get this sick from influenza. Most people here would have preferred the latter. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now, as we said, this powerful strain is no surprise. Public health authorities have been watching its approach for months now. H3N2 made a dramatic entrance early in the Australian winter, June 2017, sounding global alarm bells for the northern hemisphere winter to come. More than 230,000 people got sick. That's two and a half times the number the previous winter. A few months later, and flu numbers are well above baseline in Europe and the UK. In the United States, nearly 33,000 cases have been reported so far. That is three times last season's number. And all right, Rosie, you have a story that we were talking about earlier today. At first glance, it sounded like it had to be a mistake. Yeah, it sure sounded like it. It all started, Adrian, when a same-sex couple applied for a social insurance number for one of their kids. To explain to them, well, you're... you're Mother's maiden name is actually your father's last name. Just, just doesn't fit well. 
How's that for confusing? I am. Nick Bonar and Graham Mac McDonnell are a couple, but when they tried to apply for their adopted children's social insurance numbers, they were told they needed to enter the mother's name. For a family with two dads, it was an unwanted holdover from an earlier time that they were shocked to encounter in 2018. So that's when they reached out to CBC News. Here's Kayla Hounsell. It's a typically busy morning at the Bonner McDonnell household. Breakfast is being served. Okay. Okay, that's yours. Book bags are being stuffed and teeth are being brushed. It'd be crazy here in the morning. There are three kids, one dog, one cat, and two dads. We're uh, a modern family. He and his partner recently opened education savings plans for the children, and as part of that process, the kids needed social insurance numbers. That turned out to be anything but typical. All Canadians have to apply for social insurance numbers in person unless they live more than 100 kilometres from a Service Canada office, in which case they will be permitted to apply by mail. Bonner went to the Service Canada location nearest him in Nova Scotia. That's when he was told there was a field in the obligatory electronic system for mother's maiden name that could not be bypassed. He says the employee suggested he use his partner's last name. Within the system, he's listed as uh, mother. Why is that, though? What did they tell you? Uh, they just said the system is uh, somewhat archaic and um, that there's no work. The only workaround they can do is put his name in there in order to produce a sim. They told you that the system is archaic? Yeah. The couple says they're uncomfortable being asked to put incorrect information in an official government document because of their same-sex relationship. We're no different, so, you know, it should be just singular across the board. You know, parent one, parent two. The spokesperson for the minister responsible for Service Canada acknowledges this is a problem across the country and says the minister's office wasn't aware until now. Well, certainly this is not well aligned with the values and conditions of Canada in 2018. It also shows we have still more work to do. Meanwhile, the bonner McDonnell kids are off to school and their parents are happy their voices have been heard and will bring about change. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Some news tonight on the National Inquiry into Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls. There's been another staff departure from the inquiry. Executive Director Debbie Reed has left her post. The commission says it cannot discuss why, just that it's, quote, a personal matter. Reed only took on that job last October, and hers is just the latest departure. At least 15 people have either quit, been fired, or laid off over the past 12 months. Tonight, the Minister of Crown and Indigenous Relations responded. Carolyn Bennett says she's concerned about the amount of turnover at the commission, but that the independence of the commission is crucial and we aren't going to interfere in internal matters. Minister Bennett and other members of the federal cabinet are currently in London, Ontario, for two days of talks. And tonight, at a town hall meeting, the Prime Minister was reminded about Canada's relationship with Indigenous people. I wanted you to, to remember that you're speaking uh, about us and to keep that in mind. You don't speak over us. So I, I, I don't say that to offend you, Mr. Prime Minister. I just say that as to, as to why I stood. I want you to always remind that when you talk about the First Peoples here, that, that we're here and we need that voice. Just one of the many topics on the minds of many Canadians that are at these town halls. Another big one, though, dogging the Prime Minister and many of his cabinet ministers, NAFTA. Hannah Thibodeau has that. The Prime Minister and his inner circle came here hoping to focus on the country's strong fiscal performance. Looking forward to great conversations about, uh, about the economy, about jobs, about a broad range of issues uh, uh, facing Canadians. But there's one overriding issue. What will happen to the economy if U.S. President Donald Trump follows through on his threat to pull out of NAFTA. I think we need to take our neighbours at their word, take them seriously, and so Canada is prepared for every eventuality. Freeland says the government is actively preparing for a potential U.S. withdrawal, but no one will divulge details about that contingency plan. The International Trade Minister says Canada won't be a pushover and cave in to unfair trade practices. We'll stand up for Canadian workers. You get respect. When people see that you're firm, you get respect. The next round of NAFTA talks will take place in Montreal at the end of the month. But Trump may not be ready to pull the plug that quickly after all. He told the Wall Street Journal today his administration may be willing to continue to negotiate until after the Mexican election in the summer. 
but in his typical fashion, also said it would have to be a Trump deal. The liberal government is just past the halfway mark of its four-year mandate. And while NAFTA is an issue it has to deal with, there are still lots of other priorities it has to fulfill. And the people are here to tell the prime minister what they think. Questioning Trudeau on everything from boil water advisories and tax loopholes to how he deals with haters. After the big public Q&A, tomorrow it's back to close quarters with his cabinet to drill down on the government's remaining priorities. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, London, Ontario. Okay, that's in this country. NAFTA, though, not exactly top of mind down in Washington. Immigration, though, certainly was. The president met congressional leaders on a file that is so divisive in that country. At some point, a possible compromise was reportedly being put forward, ensuring certain protections for people from some African nations and from Haiti. And that's when Donald Trump is said to have revealed more of what he really thinks. Paul Hunter joins me now from Washington. And Paul, I'm sure some people have heard this word already but you're going to say it now. Tell us what he said. Yeah, well, when talk turned to Haiti and countries in Africa at that meeting, he apparently said, this is a quote, why are we having all these people from shithole countries come here? You can't dance around it. Those are the words of the president of the United States. It brings back to the fore the suggestion he is not only contemptuous but racist. He apparently suggested he prefer immigrants from places like Norway, the White House has not denied these words. In fact, here's what a deputy White House press secretary said tonight. Certain Washington politicians choose to fight for foreign countries, but President Trump will always fight for the American people. Reaction has been swift and blunt. A Democratic lawmaker tonight called it blatant, odious, insidious racism. A Republican lawmaker, a daughter of Haitian immigrants, called it unkind, divisive, elitist, and flying in the face of our nation's values. Some context. Tomorrow is the eighth anniversary of the Haiti earthquake, which is why the Haitians he's talking about are here in the first place, because of a program giving safe haven to people in dire need. And the end of next week marks one year since Trump was sworn into office on a promise to lead through this prism, America first. A year later, here he is. And while all kinds of Americans are aghast at this, cable TV commentators down here tonight have gone wild over it. Don't ever forget. All kinds of other Americans tonight are saying, right on, he's our guy. It continues to be a remarkable time in this country, Rosie. Thank you, Paul. The CBC's Paul Hunter in Washington for us tonight. And Andrew, the president continues to be unvarnished, to say the least. <laughs> Yeah, well, even from someone known for his unpredictability, that was uh, surprising today. Uh, okay, let's move on, shall we? Canada has named its men's hockey team, a 25-man roster pulling talent from seven different leagues across North America and Europe. But, of course, the most notable thing is who isn't on the team. No Sidney Crosby, no Carey Price, no Connor McDavid, no current NHLers, period. The league decided months ago it didn't want to disrupt its season. But that's not to say there isn't some serious talent on the team otherwise. Maxime Lapierre made the cut. He plays overseas but has more than 600 NHL games under his belt. There's Ben Scrivens, the only goalie in NHL history to record 59 or more saves in a shutout. And Derek Roy, who had four straight 60-point seasons during his NHL career. Aaron Collins has more on how the team was put together and the one big challenge they may yet face. Team Canada won't have Carey Price or Jonathan Taves for any last-minute heroics at this Olympics. Instead, they'll rely on veterans like Ben Scrivens and Mason Raymond to bring home the gold. No current NHL players on this squad, but no lack of heart. This team will play, make Canada proud. There will be a gold medal effort. Centering pass, Volsky in. He scores, Wojtek Volsky. Canada will hang its hopes on a group of ex-NHLers like Wojtek Wolski and Rennie Bork to win actual gold. Still, being picked to play for Team Canada, any Team Canada, is special. The phone calls we made yesterday to the players who made the team were incredible. We had families crying. We had players crying. Derek Roy scored more than 500 points over 13 seasons in the NHL. These days he plays in Sweden, and that's where he got the call. A little nervous uh, heading into last night, but once I got the phone call, you know, all those nerves went away and, and, and became excitement. So it's a dream come true, and to represent your country at the Olympics, it's a, it's a great feeling.
The players on this edition of Team Canada may not end up here at the Hockey Hall of Fame, but Hockey Canada is hoping fans across the country get behind them anyway. Everybody says, oh, we're not getting the NHL players. These are the guys who maybe didn't get a fair shake, didn't produce the way that they were supposed to. Most of these guys probably still played World Juniors and we cheered for them at some point, so why wouldn't we cheer for them now? Canada's won three of the last four Olympic hockey tournaments, but without NHL players competing, picking a favourite this time is difficult. We don't know how they're going to do. No one knows how they're going to do because we don't know what the other competition is just yet. We're still a month away. Uh, but I got a feeling if there's an organization to, uh, to bet on in a positive way, Team Canada does everything right from the top to the bottom. It's still the Olympics. It's still Team Canada. But with no NHL star power and with many of the games being played in the middle of the night here at home, the big question remains, is anybody going to bother watching? Aaron Collins, CBC News, Calgary. Now, regardless, expectations are always high for Team Canada, and that was the case back in 1988 when, even without NHL players, the country had gold on its mind in Calgary. Canada hasn't won a gold medal in hockey since 1952, but this time it was to be different. Organizers believe that with enough time, money, and training, they could build a medal contender. But we all remember how that turned out. In case you don't, the Soviets slaughtered Canada, 5-0. The Canadians eventually coming fourth, walking away without a medal. This year, though, Team Canada is hoping to buck history, seeking a third straight gold, and its first without NHL players since 1952. In Southern California, search and rescuers are facing a monumental task trying to locate more victims after flooding and mudslides triggered by heavy rains just swept away those homes. And to get a sense of just how powerful those storms are, take a look at the very moment a relentless torrent of muddy earth came gushing down a Santa Barbara street. The flash floods right there! Get out of here, go! Oh my God, Mom! Close the door! Marco Farrell's parents decided not to leave ahead of this week's storm after feeling evacuation fatigue from last month's wildfires. Now their 40-year-old family home is destroyed, but they managed to escape. So many others just couldn't outrun deadly walls of mud and debris that roared down Southern California hillsides. In Montecito, some 700 rescuers are frantically combing for those still missing. And an update now on two incredible rescues we brought you on Tuesday that have made headlines around the world. 14 year old Lauren Canton is still recovering in hospital after firefighters spent six hours carefully sifting through rubble, freeing her from the ruins of her Montecito home. Her brother Jack and father Dave are still missing. And then there was this rescue. We heard a, a little baby cry, and uh, finally came up and uh, dug down and found a little baby. I don't know where it came from. But, uh, we got it out, got the mud out of its mouth. I'm hoping it's okay. They took it right to the hospital. Berkeley Johnson is being hailed as a hero in this disaster. We do have an update on that two-year-old girl. The girl's okay. Uh, it's un un unbelievable. If you'd seen that, just there was no way that we should have found that child. And, and probably 15 more minutes it wouldn't have been alive because it was cold and it had been there for a while. So miraculously, uh, that little one, that two-year-old, is okay, only suffered injuries to her hip. Wow. Incredible. Still ahead tonight, he's faced some tough questions. We've seen them and some heated exchanges. What's really the goal for the Prime Minister's town hall tour? The Ad Issue panel here to break that down and much more. And we've all heard of smart speakers, but really, what about talking toilets? Do we really need to talk to all that stuff? <laughs> but first, it is uh, one of the most common weight loss surgeries out there. Marketplace investigates gastric banding and just how many people need to get it removed. It's not worth it. It's not worth the pain. It doesn't work. Normal pose here. 
News reporting is never a nine to five job. Newsmen are at work around the clock in a variety of locations. Reading, reflect the fit, heal a bit, that's good. Now let me take a reading on your face. I need that's four, that's four and a half, fine. It's two to one ratio. Face down. Face down and face up, eh? Yeah. So you want, you want it uh, about 15, 20 seconds on you? And then, and then you want me to pass onto the habit? Zoom. But it's not just a matter of standing in front of a film camera. A reporter has to research his story first, and it may take several hours to garner the facts for a report which will occupy less than 90 seconds of airtime. It looks like another record year for the Port of Montreal. Elevators are still moving last year's bumper wheat crop, and Expo provided heavy business in the first month he of He must think of ways to illustrate his story, as in this case, through the use of silent film being shot simultaneously by another cameraman elsewhere in the harbor area. On the air, the two films will be married, so that the silent film illustrates what the reporter is talking about. I came to Chicago after being involved. And these days, the job of TV reporter isn't solely a man's domain. This girl was one of the first women TV reporters in Canada. She came to television via newspaper work and quickly found a niche doing interviews from a woman's angle. News can be a rough business, however, and a girl reporter must be equally adept at covering everything from a fashion show to a prison riot. It's in an interview such as this, however, that she can probably draw more information from her subject than a wide-eyed male what counterpart ever would. Uh, before you decide to become a bunny? Well, oddly enough, I was a school teacher. I taught in a high school just outside of Boston in a very, little tiny town, taught speech, drama, and English. On the National Tonight, new sexual misconduct allegations against former Montreal Symphony conductor Charles Dutois. The Associated Press is reporting the accounts of six more women, including one who says he raped her in 1988. Dutois says there's no truth to the allegations. Also tonight, a special public avalanche warning for parts of the BC interior. The problem, unstable snowpack mixed with warming temperatures. Just a couple of days ago, a 36-year-old man died in an avalanche near Fernie. Well, each year, thousands of Canadians go under the knife in an attempt to get their weight under control. Bariatric surgeries have been on the rise for years, but there is one particular method that seems to be causing big problems for many patients. Asha Tomlinson with Marketplace investigates. We're good. In Edmonton, Dr. Chris Deguerra is about to remove another gastric band. It's a silicone device implanted at the top of the stomach meant to shrink the appetite. Patients who, who must have these things removed come in with a history of vomiting intermittently, difficulty swallowing. Okay, there. Across Canada, surgeons like Daguerre have taken out nearly 2,400 bands over the last seven years. Many of them put in at private clinics. Marketplace crunched the numbers, and each removal costs anywhere from $3,000 to $14,000, leaving taxpayers on the hook for up to $33 million. Say goodbye to every diet under the sun. It was a commercial like this that lured in Barb Litt. They had me hook, line, and sinker. Slimban used to be one of the leading weight loss surgery clinics in the country, and Barb's procedure wasn't cheap, around $16,000. As for the results? I lost 25 pounds and I regained that back. So in total, I maybe kept 10 pounds off. Then she started experiencing shooting pain in her side. Since I bump into something, I'm like, I'm deviled over in the pain. Lit had her band removed in hospital. So did Maxine Jeffrey. Her slim band was removed in emergency surgery after severe complications. She couldn't keep food down and eventually couldn't even swallow water. My stomach was so irritated from getting stuck that it had swollen shut. Slimband is no longer taking new patients and wouldn't talk to us on camera. I don't think anyone's here. No. But Jeffrey and Lit are not the only ones. There have been numerous complaints and complications connected to gastric banding, 
including the band slipping or eroding with bleeding and blockages. Problems Dr. David Urbach knows all too well. He removes one to two bands a month at this Toronto hospital. We suspect that nearly all of the bands that are placed at some point will need to be removed for one reason or another. So the clinics are very happy to privatize all the gains, uh, but they uh, essentially socialize the losses because those are all born uh, in the public system where we absorb the risk of looking after problems. And Asha joins us now with more. So if that procedure isn't working, is, is there anything that does? Well, Dr. Urbach says the gold standard, really, of all bariatric operations is the gastric bypass, which is publicly funded, and it's meant to restrict food intake and calorie absorption. Both Urbach and Daguerre say it's a better long-term solution because there's more aftercare support. But even that, not, not everyone's eligible, right? It's true. So there's a strict criteria to qualify for this surgery. You need a very high body mass index. So we're talking high 30s, 40s onwards. And they also take into consideration any weight-related conditions like diabetes or sleep apnea, for example. But even if you don't qualify, Dr. Urbach says, that's probably good news. It means you likely don't need a drastic measure like surgery. And you could just make lifestyle changes to really accomplish your goals. Okay, Ash Tomlinson, thanks very much. Thank you. So tune in to CBC's Marketplace tomorrow at 8 p.m. Eastern for the full story. Up next, the Ad Issue panel is standing by to tackle the latest wrinkle in NAFTA negotiations and also this. Um, the f so sorry, if, if you will not... Are you done? Thank you. Okay. As the pace of modern war speeds up, the motorcyclist becomes of more and more vital importance, not only for the carrying of messages, but for liaison and reconnaissance work. The highly mechanized Canadian Army was quick to recognize the importance of well-trained riders. The trick of easy starting is in the throttle and spark controls. When they're set right, the bike starts at the first kick. Well, Sometimes. The open highway is the next step for the student riders. The valuable part of this experience is the frequent use of gears, the result of going at higher speeds. The various hand signals and other rules of the road are all a part of highway training. The machine must not be steered. Corners are taken by swinging the weight of the body to one side or the other. Life becomes more complicated as the students learn the art of bushwhacking. The trick in cross-country work is to stand up on the footrests, letting the knees take the shocks of uneven ground. In training dispatch riders especially, is this type of cross-country riding vital? For in wartime, roads become targets for artillery and bombers. And well known to every motorcyclist is the trick of tying a strong cable across the road. Riding a series of small ridges without leaving the ground teaches control of acceleration. On the upgrade, the riders lean well back to get traction. On the way down, they use the valve lifter to prevent compression in the cylinders. Water obstacles are all in the day's work. Streams up to a foot and a half deep can be safely boarded as long as the throttle is wide open, speed being controlled by the clutch. If the engine stalls, the machine must be pushed clear before restarting. Loose sand is one of the most difficult surfaces for motorcycle riding. Even with skilled riders, Skids and spills are frequent. So when these Canadian Army riders can negotiate successfully the ups and downs of the sand hills, they are ready to return to their units. Highly trained men possessing the confidence of sure knowledge.
the trained dispatch rider is now ready to do his job. A job of vital importance, but one of great danger and bodily strain. An isolated infantry platoon has been ordered to attack at 0600 hours. But aerial reconnaissance has shown that the troops will advance into a trap. They must be warned. They must delay the attack until artillery fire is brought to bear. They've no wireless set. A runner wouldn't make it in time. The only way to reach them is by motorcycle. The message must get through. And the Don R sets out to get it through. Through hell and high water. When it comes to the more unconventional US proposals, uh, we have been doing some creative thinking. We've been talking with Canadian stakeholders. And we have some new ideas that we look forward to talking with our US and Mexican counterparts about in Montreal. So I think if there is goodwill on all sides, uh, we could have a great outcome in Montreal. But having said that, uh, the U.S. has been very clear since before the talk started that invo invoking Article 2205 was a possibility. And I think we need to take our neighbors at their word, take them seriously. And so Canada is prepared for every eventuality. All right, versions of that answer have been given time and time again since NAFTA renegotiations began. But that clip actually from this morning when Christia Freeland arrived at the Liberal Cabinet retreat, it comes after we learned yesterday that Canada has now launched a complaint with the WTO claiming the U.S. violates international trade rules. Lots of new NAFTA fodder for our very own at issue. Andrew Coyne is in Toronto. Paul Wells is here with me in Ottawa, and Stachy Curl is in Vancouver. Chantal is away tonight because I'm going to get tweets about it. I know it. Um, let's start with you, Andrew. Is there a I, I, some of that language there was a little different for me? This whole we are doing some creative exploring about what to do. Is there a new position here, or is Canada in some way doing something different, particularly with the WTO offensive? Well, you, you tell me. It, there's always, you know, multidimensional posturing in any of these negotiations, and this one more than most. Partly posturing vis-a-vis -vis their, their negotiating partners, partly directed at the home audience, partly, I think, in some cases, trying to prep them for the possible or indeed probable failure of the talks. There does seem to be a kind of a, a good cop, bad cop thing here, where on the one hand, they've got this, we're going to be really tough with them at the WTO, and look at how tough we're being, and on the other hand, well, maybe we can be more conciliatory on some of the, uh, the auto stuff. Again, if you're going to be making concessions maybe for the home audience, you also want to look like you're, like you're being tough in another forum. Um, but it's, you know, the, so much of this thing is, is swathed in, in posturing and, and, and theater. Paul. So much so that um, the stories that came out earlier this week where Canadian sources said they were pretty sure that Trump was getting ready to abrogate this treaty look more and more like they were planted precisely to have the effect they had on the markets to scare right. Trump away from that. Hmm. Uh, in other words, they never really expected him to actually do it. They were just trying to scare him away from the eventuality of doing it. Um, we're entering what I think of as the purgatory phase of this debate uh, because it's it's starting to look like Trump actually has no intention of ever cancelling the treater, treaty. But neither realistically does he ever have any chance of accepting any proposal from Canada or Mexico. The upshot is that there's a very good chance that if he serves out his term, we could still be, we could still have a Canadian officials in Mexico and Washington negotiating this sucker until the end of his term. And if it keeps uh, uh, Canada and Mexico on edge for those next three years, it's not actually uh, clear to me that Trump's successor, if the successor were a Republican, would change the policy of, of keeping this sort of Damocles uh, dangling over the NAFTA head just indefinitely. Well, that's good news for our business, but I'm not sure it's good news <laughs> for trade. Uh, Shachi, what, what do you think? Has there been a shift, or is this going to be an endless game of posturing, as, as the fellows seem to think? Well, it takes an impact or a toll on Canadians and Canadian business regardless. Sure. So, you know, you've got Canadians who are overwhelmingly and increasingly pessimistic and worried about what's going to come. Uh, but when it comes to new or different directions or something really radical, uh, when you talk to Trump Nation, they like Canada. This is still not a Canadian issue for them. It's a Mexican issue. So the Canadians could always go for broke. It's not a very Canadian thing to do, but say, hey, Mexico, we love you, but 
maybe we have to cut you loose. Just, just to take up uh, Paul's uh, big if there, if he serves out his term. This is a wounded president. He's down in the 30s in approval. Uh, he's got the, the Mueller inquiry closing in on him closer and closer. He's got midterms coming up, in which case the, Ameri the Republicans may do very poorly. Um, so there's a case to be made for kind of stalling and, and playing out the clock on our side, uh, because the longer things go on, it seems to me that the weaker his negotiating position is. Okay, I'm going to shift, if I can, to what our, our guy was doing most of the week, so far anyway, and that is uh, town halls. Here's a little clip of him at one of them talking about why he's doing it. The more politicians uh, and people who have a responsibility of representing and serving their communities uh, spend time with folks across the country, listening to their concerns, uh, sharing uh, our reflections on where we're going as a country, uh, working together to solve some of the big challenges, the better we do at actually representing and serving you. So, I mean, I, you know, that's something that Trudeau is good at. He's obviously comfortable in those sort of forums. But I wonder, Paul, how much are we all actually getting from that, given that, yeah, some of the questions aren't screened, but they're also not questions from, from journalists, for instance. Well, I mean, there's two sides to that. Uh, if he had stayed in uh, Ottawa this week and taken questions from legacy media folks like you and me, he would have had about 80 questions about the Aga Khan and the ethics commissioner. On the road, he gets a lot fewer questions of that kind, and that's probably uh, a welcome break for him. The questions he does get are, are much more uh, surprising and unpredictable. Uh, mm -hmm. Questions from ordinary people tend to be a lot less sort of um, uh, urgently repetitive than questions from professional journalists, <laughs> and he's had some surprises on the road. Yeah. Um, uh, on, on one hand, good for him just uh, showing that openness and that flexibility. Uh, every prime minister that I've covered has benefited from, from, from going on the road every once in a while. On the other hand, he's going to have to run for re-election in a couple of years, and uh, he's going to uh, be in debates. And it, it would be good if he rehearsed being surprised with tough questions uh, from here to there. It, it toughens him up. It's essentially sparring practice. Okay, Shachi, what, what is the benefit to doing this? Does it outweigh the risk? It must, I guess, if he keeps doing it. Well, neither venue is going to be a real driver of higher approval for the prime minister. He either gets grilled uh, by parliamentary committee members who know exactly what to ask and exactly how to ask it, or he runs the risk of, of really, uh, you know, dropping a clangor out there and, and fumbling a question. So far, that hasn't happened. So far, he is less dancing bear in, in the ring and more circus master. You know, he's <laughs> shushing the audience. He's encouraging people to finish their questions. Uh, so politicians, to Paul's point, really do love these town hall functions, which, by the way, have a history that go back in North America to the 1600s. So they're pretty uh, a legitimate part of, of the political structure. They love them until they don't love them. And when they go wrong, they go badly wrong. And of course, I'm reminded of Jean Chrétien, who used to love his bear pit sessions until one happened to be broadcast live. I think it was on this broadcast on The National about 20 years ago. Uh, he fumbles a question on his promise to scrap the GST. We never saw him do it again. But more than that, it creates weeks of distraction for him and for that government. And because this is a totally spontaneous panel, we happen to have that clip. So I'll play it and then I'll get Andrew to react. <laughs> I voted for you. I didn't read the Red Book. I voted for you based on your promise to repeal the GST. And uh, you did, did not... Did you read the Red Book on that? It's not what we said no, in the I... Red Book. You should have read it. D you, you said, but you were saying in all your speeches that you, pr that you were no, promising no. to repeal the We always said that GST. we were to harmonize the tax with the provincial government. We never said in the Red Book or directly that it was to be scrapped. I didn't hear simpler. I heard scrapped. I mean, but I don't know. From, from whom? Well, from, from you on television and when? on the radio during the campaign. Which radio? This is what I heard. <laughs> I hadn't seen that. And it was also nice to see Peter on TV again. Andrew, what, that, is the, that is the problem with these things. They can go off the rails, particularly if you forget what you said. Yeah, th that's the exception to prove the rule, though, I think. I mean, that's yeah. the only example I think most of us can think of. These things are almost can't lose, for the most part, for mm -hmm. the leader. Uh, for one thing, you get, with the ones that Trudeau is doing, they tend to self-select as people who are generally predisposed Bam. towards them. Yeah. The yeah. questions are either either softballs that you can head out of the park, or even if they're hard questions, they're, if, if you're from an activist party as he is, they're kind of in your wheelhouse because they're asking the government typically to do more stuff. And mm -hmm. even if you can't necessarily please them, you're, you're kind of playing to your a philosophical predisposition. And then finally, even if it's a question that's a really bad question, you get points for, for taking it and standing there and being open, et cetera. So why more politicians don't do it, I don't know. He's, as you mentioned, particularly good at this. Uh, but Stephen Harper, I think uh, that was one of the many 
uh, foolish political uh, tax they took was walling them off away from that, you almost always come out as a positive. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Thanks, everybody. If you want to uh, listen to these guys again, or if you want to hear a little more, because the Ad Issue Gang also does an extra on the podcast, be sure to subscribe. You'll hear uh, everything you heard this week and a little bit more. What would you do with a hundred million dollars? One person who wishes to remain anonymous has given it to the Center for Addiction and Mental Health. And our Stephanie Skanderis met a mental health researcher who really hopes to take advantage of that record donation. Colin Hocko studies patterns in the brain that cause mental illness. We want to understand what's happening in the brain that's causing people to have these illnesses and help psychiatrists understand how to treat those illnesses based on their biology. He's clearly passionate about the work. Maybe there's five types of depression. And type 1 responds to brain stimulation, type 2 responds to medication. So we can tell the physician, well, this person has type 1 depression, this is how you should treat them. He's the kind of young scientist the $100 million donor wants to support with the creation of the Discovery Fund. I have seen the devastating impact of mental illness, the mystery person says. I want to provide support to the next generation of researchers and scientists to pursue the research that will directly transform care. I'm trying to gather my thoughts to even uh, imagine where to start about how amazing this is uh, for the world of mental health uh, and an area of health care that has for too long been marginalized, uh, been held separate from health care. But a new trend is emerging. Between 1998 and 2004, CAMH raised $10.4 million from private donors. From 2011 to 2017, it raised $285 million. For those who have worked to end the stigma around mental health, there's a new challenge. As Canadians talk more and more about mental illness, those who are experiencing mental health problems are feeling more comfortable uh, speaking about their experience and seeking the help that they need, and especially seeking help early on. That does increase demand on services. A gift like this comes with a responsibility. Hocko says he'll start his application to the Discovery Fund on Monday. Stephanie Skanderis, CBC News, Toronto. When we come back, Google and Amazon normally take a pass on the Consumer Electronics Show, but this year they are all over it, hoping to take voice command technology to the next level. But how many items do we really need to talk to? It's really adding a layer of intelligence and getting technology products to uh, work a little bit better into your life. Open can. The beautiful game's beautiful Beckham just made a beautiful move. A decision to head way west, to leave behind his beloved English home and Spanish soccer team and play for Los Angeles. Expecting shock and horror? Not a chance. That's probably very good for Spain. I think the national IQ average will go up. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. Posh wants to go, so he's going. Beckham decides that he will. People can be cruel and forgetful. David Beckham has been a much revered soccer star and an adored marketing darling. That face and his glam wife Victoria, once the Spice Girl posh, make the Beckham package irresistible. And yes, those are the wax images of the Beckhams as Mary and Joseph in a nativity scene. But soccer life hasn't been quite as smooth recently. The experts here, and quite frankly, there are a lot of people in this country who claim to be experts, say that Beckham the player was slipping in his skills on the pitch and needed to do something. Beckham's leaving, going to L.A., what do you think? Washed up. That's it. It's all over, I think. Still, to wear the L.A. Galaxy jersey, he'll reportedly be paid nearly $300 million over five years. David Beckham will probably actually earn in a region of 50 times more than most of his teammates, if not more. Um, so that kind of gives you a sense of the scale of his deal. That'll make for some happy times in the locker Absolutely, room. Absolutely, yeah. It's been interesting, probably trying to kick him, I imagine, in trading after the first, first few days. The money, the man himself says, has nothing to do with it. I don't want to go out to America at 34 years old and people be turning around saying, well, he's only going there to, to get the money. You know, it's not what I'm going out there to do. I'm going out there to to hopefully build, you know, a club and a team that has got a lot of potential. He will, soccer fans hope, bring new life to the North American game and to the new soccer league, one a Toronto team is a part of, 
just maybe a little bit of the Beckham brilliance will rub off. Adrian Arsenault, CBC News, London. That's one of the best things about being me, uh, really, to have the the following of so many kids around the world. You know, when I, I, I've seen it in Europe, I've seen it in, in Asia and different parts of the world, but then to come to the, to the States and to see the reaction that, that I've had so far from not just obviously the, the, the older people and, you know, the press that I've had, but from, from the younger people as well. And especially, you know, the girls and, and the boys that are, that are playing so soccer at such a, such a young age. So it's, it's an honour for me. I feel honoured. It's definitely about the sport. It's definitely about the soccer. Um, obviously, it's also about me being an ambassador. Um, it's definitely not about going into semi-retirement. There's only people that have been out there that have criticised me, uh, mostly in Europe, for, for coming to a league that is not as high profile and also is not uh, at a level that you know La Liga is or the Premiership is. Um, so no, it's definitely not about semi-retirement. It's about growing a league and being part of something which potentially could, could be huge. Um, and I want to be part of that. And Yeah, the big trends are in voice assistants and artificial intelligence. So think Amazon Alexa, the Google Assistant. Voice technology, all the rage at this year's Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. To some, it is the ultra-modern, high-tech 21st century we were promised as kids. To others, it's just unnecessary, overblown, even intrusive. But considering all the money that tech companies like Google and Amazon have poured into it, it is likely here to stay. So speaking of those two heavyweights, they normally don't even bother with the consumer electronics show, but they are back in a big way this year, as are all the companies trying to cash in on the voice command craze. Our Kim Brunhuber was there too. Sure, there are the robot maids and the glasses that allow the blind to see, but this, this is the future. That's right, a toilet that you can talk to, tell it to flush or whatever you'd want to discuss with your commode. And how much does this one run? The new Mi Black will start at about $7,500. Wow. The hottest thing in the world of technology these days is your voice. You want a pizza, me? Soon you'll be able to tell an almost infinite number of things what to do. Open can. Thousands of products at the world's largest tech convention respond to commands or a link to voice assistants like Amazon's Alexa or Google Assistant. Industry analyst Ben Arnold says what he's seeing here is bringing us closer to the idea of ambient computing in which all the electronics around us can sense us and respond to our needs. It's more than just controlling technology products with your voice. It's really adding a layer of intelligence and getting technology products to uh, work a little bit better into your life. According to one estimate, by the end of this year, intelligent assistance will be in one million Canadian homes. With the battle for smart speaker supremacy heating up, no coincidence that this was the first time Google has displayed at this convention for years. Hey Google, what does artificial intelligence mean? Artificial intelligence. The Toronto IT specialist Nick Hartman is impressed by what he's seen so far. It's a future just by interacting with voice. This is fantastic. But do you actually need to converse with all of your appliances? Probably not. With companies rushing to get on the voice tech bandwagon, in many cases they may be solving problems that don't exist. You can have the voice activated washer and dryer, but you still have to move the wet clothes, the wet clean clothes from the washer to the dryer, and why not just push start like you can do already? You can use voice to control it. Take smart home technology. The tech graveyard is littered with smart products no one wanted. Voice control alone, say those in the industry, isn't enough. These are things like, hey, I just want to be able to automate turning on my lights, or I just want to be able to turn my thermostat up or down. Those are not really delivering on any major value proposition. I will get a drink. If it doesn't make what you're doing faster, better, or cheaper, then it's just a $7,000 toilet that listens. Kim Brunhuber, CBC News, Las Vegas. Kim makes a good point. Who wants to drop a month's salary on a gossip thrown in? Yet, Google and Amazon are investing in this kind of technology in a huge way. So let's bring in our senior technology reporter, Matt Braga, for a little more insight. 
all these listening devices in our homes, Matt, is this the end of, you know, tapping out a search for information? <laughs> so for certain types of tasks, things that you would otherwise uh, open up an app for, checking your weather, playing music, turning on your lights, turning on your dishwasher perhaps, uh, all of these things are things that Google and Amazon want to make a little bit more natural, like you were just asking a friend or a family member to do these things. And to do that, now we're seeing them expand beyond speakers to actually put this functionality in the light switches, in your car, in the speakers, in the fridges themselves. Okay, so it's all very convenient. <laughs> I, I get that, but the cynical part of me says this isn't actually about my convenience, it's about my data. So mm -hmm. what, what exactly are they looking for? Uh, so Amazon and Google, of course, are both companies. They exist to make money. Amazon, that being selling you more things. Uh, Google selling advertising. And so, of course, they're going to be interested in things like what music you're playing, when you're turning on your lights, when you're getting home, where you're going. Uh, all this is stuff that they can infer through your use of these devices and uh, certainly stuff that they could use to further their business goals. Oh, and when you buy one, are you actively signing on for that information to be collected? Uh, so in both cases, you do have some degree of control over what you share. I know with Google in particular, you can uh, give it the ability to use your search history or to use things like location in some of its responses. Um, but by and large, the, the delineation that these companies make is, uh, while well, they say that they don't share or sell your personal information, things that have been stripped of personal information, so-called de-identified data, uh, can be a little bit more fair game. Last question, very briefly. I've tried one of these things. Feels a little clumsy. Is the tech ready, really? <laughs> so one of the big hurdles I think these companies still have to overcome is context, right? They understand what they've been programmed to understand. They don't really understand us the way that humans do. And so the that's the thing. The way you and I do. Absolutely. Okay. And so that's what we're working towards next. <laughs> okay, Matt Braga, thanks very much. Thanks, Adrian. Now, one of the other, one of the hotter topics from this year's Consumer Electronics Show wasn't actually at the show, but rather at an unaffiliated location nearby, popular with a certain subset of technology lover. Okay, it was, uh, it was a strip club. So these robot pole dancers are performing down the street from the electronics show, which has sparked considerable debate on social media. They've been called evidence of a deeply misogynistic tech culture, proof that robots will eventually replace humans in the bedroom, and a sleazy gimmick. But the real story is a little more nuanced. The robots were actually created by British artist Giles Walker a few years ago. He calls them his commentary on voyeurism, the commodification of sex, and the surveillance state. Walker says his art is very expensive to produce, so he rents his robots out. And maybe renting to a Vegas strip club is not what you'd expect from someone who says he takes issue with voyeurism and how sleazy this world has become. But the man also says he has to earn a living too. The Olympic motto, faster, higher, stronger. Now some would add dirtier to that. It's not about the athletes, it's about how the International Olympic Committee chooses cities to host the games. 115 members do it by secret ballot. Here's the allegation. A senior IOC official says agents for bidding cities have bought votes, and it's been going on for the past decade. Price will be rather rather uh, modest, uh, something between 500000 and uh, $1 million. The 19th Olympic Winter Games in 2002 to the city of Salt Lake City. Officials in Salt Lake City say they didn't pay any bribes, but they admit to creating a special $400,000 scholarship fund used by relatives of some IOC members. The, New South the International Wales Olympic Committee says this doesn't mean other cities fair. have bought the games. We have only facts regarding Salt Lake City. No? We are investigating only Salt Lake City. A Canadian member of the IOC says it's all news to her. I've been an IOC member since 1990 and certainly personally uh, have never been approached uh, either by an agent or by a bid city. Both Vancouver and Toronto want to host the games in the next decade, and some experts suggest they may have to play dirty to win. And what happened to Salt Lake? They paid the money, they got the games. That must be very worrying for Vancouver, Whistler and for Toronto. And I think they have a very blunt choice. Officials in both Vancouver and Toronto say their choice is to keep it clean. 
bid. We said this two years ago. We would pursue the bid within the rules and make sure that our bid was honest, open and fair. In recent years, the once golden image of the Olympics has been tarnished by drugs, money and politics. But many say this scandal may set an Olympic record. Raj Alawalia, CBC News, Toronto. The IOC is profoundly disappointed about the events revealed in the last few weeks. And even before we announce the results of our inquiry, we'd like to express our sincere apologies for the actions of certain IOC members. This is a very different concept of where people may have come from. Could early humans have crossed the Atlantic Ocean during the Ice Age? We're changing the history of the world. Ice Bridge on the Nature of Things. New episode, Sunday at 8. On The National Tonight, what's next for Julian Assange now that he's been granted Ecuadorian citizenship? The WikiLeaks founder has been holed up in that country's embassy in London for more than five years. Officials say they hope this latest move helps resolve his situation. He's avoiding arrest in the UK for jumping bail. Also tonight, police in Paris say they've recovered all the jewels stolen in yesterday's brazen robbery at the Ritz Hotel. Thieves grabbed nearly $7 million worth of gems, but they made one big mistake, apparently dropping a bag of jewels while fleeing the scene. Police managed to recover the rest and then arrested three suspects, though they think two others are still on the run. Mark Zuckerberg says there are big changes coming to Facebook around the type of posts you see in your news feed. Added priority on content shared by friends and family, meaning you should see less stuff published by big brands and the media. It's a move, he says, is to promote more meaningful social interactions and says it'll be better for both users and the company long term. The New York Times has got everyone talking in Canada today. The paper released its coveted list of places to go for 2018, and it features a mix of faraway destinations and one sort of familiar one. New Orleans topped the list as the number one place you should visit this year, followed by the entire country of Colombia in the number two spot, and the Basilicata region in southern Italy ranked uh, third. One lone Canadian city did make the list. Coming in at number 18 is Saskatoon. And this had a lot of us wondering, well, why? So we took that question to one of the New York Times travel editors and, of course, to the streets of Saskatoon. And that is our moment of the day. The best thing about this list is getting the responses. It's always a mix of, um, you know, Saskatoon, great, and Saskatoon, what? I would go to the river and check out Miwasan Trail. I don't know, I've lived here so long. Um, walk along the river. We also... Uh, look for places that are interesting to travel in the coming year for a specific reason. In the case of Saskatoon, uh, that's the new Modern Art Museum, the Ramai. Check out the museums. I don't know, that's pretty fun. We're not saying go right this minute. If you're a lover of cold weather, maybe now is the time. Stay inside in the warm. Somewhere cozy with a real open fire. You know, I feel like the American newspapers are trolling each other about Saskatchewan because the Boston Globe also had a story about Saskatchewan today, basically saying, yeah, don't go. It's very, very cold. Cold enough that people are skating down the middle of the street, not on rinks. I feel like they're talking to each other and using us. <laughs> right, but, but uh, no, I, I'm fully prepared to accept that this is this is the, a real thing because, funny enough, in the, in the last few months, I've had a couple people come up to me who who aren't from Saskatoon but who have visited for for one reason or another, and they've all told me, Saskatoon's a really nice place. So so I'm I'm fully prepared to accept that this is true. It is a nice place, but as someone who is from Winnipeg, very close. Do not go there in January. That is not wise. That is just not smart. Fair enough. That's the national for January 11th. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.